Once saved, always saved, flies in the face of the constant teaching of the Bible from Genesis 1 to Revelation's end. The major evangelical voices are saying, you're saved by grace alone. It doesn't really matter how you live after you're saved. You're saved. We might have our lives cut short as a result of sinful living. We might lose some of our heavenly reward, but no matter what we do, no matter how we live, we're still saved. I grew up in an assembly which uh, taught that, that I've accepted Christ and now I'm guaranteed for all eternity. And the danger of that is that you tend to relax. Once saved, always saved makes the wide way acceptable. We're Christianizing the wide way. We have cut the whole idea of transformed living, we've cut it off at the knees. Well, I believe it's a lot of the explanation of the hypocrisy in the American church and much of the church around the world today because there's a lot of people that are living like hypocrites because they've been taught that they don't have to live holy lives. It's not over till it's over. One, that's not what one saved, always saved teaches. Two, and more importantly, that's not what the Bible teaches. Many people have seen this documentary, Once Saved, and then the line through that says, Always Saved, as though that we're not always saved. Well, people have asked me, what do you think about this? Well, I'll tell you what I think. Well, many of you already know what I think. And so what I want to do is I want to go through what they're saying. I think most of what they're saying, they make some points. As a matter of fact, I think it's well done. The way they put this together is well done uh, in 4K. It's beautifully shot. It's a pretty picture. I just think it's incorrect. I think they, one, um, kind of straw man some things. They make they say some things that I don't know really who believes. I know that there are some that might believe that. But for the most part, people don't believe that you can be saved and then live how you want to, uh, irrespective of your professed faith. Because if you live how you want to, irrespective of that, then it's probably that you don't have uh, the faith that you profess. No one is teaching that you can be saved and then go and uh, rape, murder, pillage, and so forth. No one teaches that. We teach that uh, because you're saved, you will have this clean living. Will it be perfect living? No. But one of the things, I don't know if you caught it, is that he says the reason for, or he thinks the reason for the world in the condition that it's in is because there are people who believe that you can be saved and live how you want to, and so they're the cause for the way the world is in. I'm sorry, but I'll just go out and say this. There are just as many people who believe you can lose your salvation as those who believe you cannot, who are just as rotten, who do just as many bad things. And so to lay the condition of the world at the feet of the people who believe in eternal security, I think that's wrong. So let me just say that. Now, let me go ahead. What I want to do is I want to jump into what they're saying. I want to cover that. So I'm not sure how long this is going to be. Maybe an hour will take some time at the end for questions. I know there'll be some that will disagree, but I want to go through their arguments. I want to look at what they bring up and then let's see if we can pull back and let's see if we can make sense. Maybe what they're saying is correct. I don't think so. I think what they've said, all of what they've said is incorrect. And so, yes, they, they start off by showing Dr. So-and-so, Professor So-and-so as though, and I, I get it, I get it. You want to show, you want to bring your best and brightest, your most talented. Uh, but there's just as many scholars, if not more, who might believe the other way. And so what we're going to do is, rather than re relying on them or anyone else, we're going to look at the passages ourselves. Believers in Once Saved, Always Saved invariably take the high ground historically as though they're defending the historic faith. This is incredibly dishonest. That's because before Augustine's novel teachings in the early 5th century, absolutely no one in the early church believed in once saved, always saved. This is the faith that was handed to us by the apostles. In fact, the first generation of these Christians were personally discipled by the apostles. Something I want to show you is that what they do is they draw this little this little chart to show that these are the men that were discipled. One, obviously, those that were discipled by Christ, that is Paul and Peter and John. And then you have those that were immediately discipled by them, Clement of Rome and Ignatius and Polycarp and so forth. And from that, we have 
Irenaeus and Justin Martin Tatian. And so the question is, should we have to rely on these people? Is what they're saying, is it true? And so what I want to do is I want to talk about, first of all, listening to these early church fathers, there's some benefit to listen to them. There's some things that we can glean, that we can learn from them. But the question is, how much proof, how much validity do we put into what the early church fathers have said? Here's the reason why. Some of the early church fathers, even though that they are uh, immediate disciples of the disciples or disciples of the, of, the, of the apostles or disciples of the disciples of the apostles, how much belief? Now, it makes sense that, you know what, they were the closest to the scene. However, don't we have in the Bible people who were closest to the scene who messed up? Don't we have people who were right there with Jesus who still misunderstood some things? As a matter of fact, even after Jesus and being filled with the Holy Spirit, don't we have indication that those very same men, apostles included, uh, didn't quite get everything right or did some things? And so what we have to do is we have to only, and I mean only and solely, rely on the text as our guide. There can be some benefit to hearing what they have to say, but let's be clear. Who are the early church fathers? Where do you go to take a class? Where are the credentials to say, I'm an early church father? As a matter of fact, here's a here's a fact. Most of the ones that we accept as church fathers, we don't have most of their writings. Most of their writings have not survived. And then there are a lot of writings by people who also had differing opinions who also did not survive. But let's just take a look at some of those very same people who are the so-called early church, church fathers. A lot of them had some things that we would consider to be heretical. Did you know the prevailing thought of the church at the time of the church, not of all the church fathers, but of many, was of modalism? I'm pretty sure a lot of us didn't know that, but we put a lot of we put a lot of heft behind, a lot of weight behind what they say. But a lot of them had a modalistic view. As a matter of fact, Irenaeus, he actually believed that Jesus was either 40 or 50 years old at death. Well, obviously there's a problem with that. How about Tertullian, where, the, where he says the majority of the doctrine, I'm reading this carefully, uh, the doctrine was the majority of the believers believed in this modalistic view. Now, we don't have much from Poly, Polycarp, who was a direct disciple from the Apostle John, but he goes to bat and says that we ought to believe most of Ignatius' letters. Well, Ignatius was certainly modalistic or if, if nothing else to say, uh, maybe a, even a devout modalist. What would, we say, what would we say about a person like that? Well, thankfully, Irenaeus and Tertullian and uh, Hippolytus at Oregon, the, thankfully, they didn't die on the cross. We've got people who, like Clement, who was more of a oneness bit. We've got people that believe, like Tertullian, who believe that water baptism was necessary for salvation. You have a wide view of a varying view of, of, of different beliefs from the early church fathers. Again, who are the early church fathers? Well, it depends on who you ask. And again, many of the early church fathers, we don't have most of their writings. And oh, by the way, they did change over time. So what one church father might have believed at this point initially changed as we move forward. And so what we don't want to do is put a whole lot of uh, backing behind everything that they believe. Now, there are some benefit that we can say, you know, we can at least get an understanding of what the culture was like, what society was like. For example, what if someone told you that the Holy Spirit was a created being? Where would you, what would you do with that? Well, if you say the Holy Spirit was a created being, would you accept what he, would you want to follow him? Because we have one of our more prominent early church fathers, Oregon, who believed that. And so we've got these varying beliefs. And again, some of the people in these in this documentary, early church fathers would disagree with what they were believing. And so it's just odd for someone to want to use that as proof. But oh, by the way, there were some early church fathers or some early, I should say some early church writings that actually did believe in eternal security. As a matter of fact, their view of eternal security is more in line with what we say. That is, a person is saved because that person is going to keep believing. And then if that person does not keep believing, that person was never saved to begin with. But I'm not going to fight that battle except to say that all we have to go off of and all we ever should go off of is the scripture. That being said, if we listen to them, and I'm not sure how much, I'm not sure how much we go.
the early church fathers. But when we listen to them, they're going to tell us from their point of view that all Christians, the best of Christians, are going to have ups and downs. We will have some good days and some bad days, but the pattern of our life over time is faithfulness and a steady growth. Now, I want to play that again because I, I want to highlight something. I want to I want to focus on something because we're going to come back to what he just said, because I think there's some inconsistencies that I think I know there's some inconsistencies in what they said. Let me play this again. We will have some good days and some bad days, but the pattern of our life over time is faithfulness. and. A now, let's just stop for a second. Do you all see where there's a little bit of a dip? Uh, there's one dot, the second dot, the third dot, the fourth and fifth dot are downturns. Let's say if that's someone's life, does that mean that person was um, engaging in some sin, having some bad thoughts at that time? And how long does that last? How long is that up, down, up, down when they go down for a little bit? And we've all been there. How long is that down? How long is that? Is that a week? Is that two weeks? Is it a month? Is it two? How long can a person have some down or some bad days? And what can our bad days consist of? Can it consist of us yelling at someone? What about us fighting? What about us having uh, lustful thoughts? What about us having even murders? Or what if someone flies off the handle and actually hurts someone at that time? What if they want to hurt themselves? What if they have doubts about living? What if they have suicidal doubts? You know, thoughts about, you know what, we don't even want to live. How? What if someone at that period of time, what if they even despair of life itself? Hmm. If you are having suicidal thoughts, can you can you be saved while having thoughts of, you know what, I don't want to live anymore. I have, I am despairing of life. I'm using that word for a reason. Why? Because Paul said that he and his cohorts despaired even of life itself. Lord, take us out of here. It's getting too hard. Paul makes that statement. And so my question is, how bad can your bad days be and how long can you have those bad days? What if you, what if you literally out of your mouth publicly, even before the Lord, deny him? three times. Is that a bad day? About bad two days. On the third day, you come back. Is that bad? Does that qualify? I'm, I'm just wondering because when you make those statements, we're going to see if you're going to hold to that in just a second. So what I want to do now is I want to go into some of the texts that they go to, and I want to respond to these texts as we go. Did you know that there are over 80 passages in the New Testament that warn Christians not to lose what they've got in Christ. Eighty. And most of them are ignored or overlooked or not preached about. We have warning passages in James and Peter and John. It's very difficult to think of any New Testament document that doesn't refute once saved, always saved. Now, you would think, though, that because you hear that statement, there are over 80 warning passages. I don't refute that at all. I don't have a problem with there being over 80 warning passages. As a matter of fact, I think that's a good thing. As a matter of fact, that doesn't prove their point. Now, before I go into why that's not such a big deal, if you say there's over 80 warning passages, and oh, by the way, some of the warning passages, they, they mistake, but over 80 warning passages, what if I told you that there are at least 200 passages in the Bible that speak of eternal security? of once saved, always saved. If you're going to tout numbers, tout that number. I almost, I almost, but for the sake of time, just started to rattle off at least 100. Just put in, a, put it, put it, just let it scroll across 100 scriptures that state that you cannot lose your salvation. Now, there are going to be some passages where I don't think that believes that. Well, the same thing with your, with your passage as well. But if there are 80 passages, and I believe there are, that warn about falling away or about not or keep believing or keep having faith or keep following something along those lines. That makes sense. Why does it make sense, Corey? Well, I'll tell you why. I'm glad you asked. The reason why it makes sense is because aren't there people out there who think they're saved and are not? There are people out there on both sides. People on both sides now believe that there are people who believe that they're saved and are not. They just, they wear a nice Christian shirt. They have a cross around their neck. They have the biggest, beautiful Bible. They go to church and they're not saved. We know of people like that. Matter of fact, probably one time we were people like that. Who knows? But we know of people like that. Now, 
that being ca the, 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 uh, the case, shouldn't the Bible, because if you, I ask someone this question, if you know of someone who is not saved, but they think they're safe and you have a pretty good indication. Now, obviously you're not God. You can't see into their heart, but you're just looking at their actions. You're hearing their words. You, you, you know them closely and you want to warn them. If you know somebody that you think is saved and you want to warn them, would you? You love them. You'd warn them, right? So why do we think that we're so much better than God, than the Bible? Shouldn't the Bible have warning passages about people who think they're saved? As a matter of fact, we're going to look at some of these warning passages and they, I think they missed the boat. So before we do that, let's go ahead and look at some of the passages that they bring up as proof that you can certainly lose your salvation. In 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27, I think you have one of the clearest passages in all the entire Bible that uh, you could forfeit your salvation because nobody's going to doubt the Apostle Paul saved. Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable one. So I do not run aimlessly. I don't box as one beating the air. I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Disqualified, put out of the race. Not a question of coming in second or third. It's amazing because he uses that word adakamas elsewhere when talking to the Corinthians or writing to the Corinthians. And he states in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he warns in verse 21 of those who have not yet repented of their, their sexual immorality, their, their sin and so forth. And he warns them that they must, you know, examine themselves. In chapter 13, verse 5, he says, examine yourselves, uh, test yourselves to see whether or not you're in the faith unless you are. Now, I want to go through that. I want to, I want, I, I've got a bunch of passages up. As a matter of fact, I've got different windows up. If you all see here, see me, you'd think, okay, Corey, don't crash the show. You're not the most technologically skilled person. So don't crash the show. I'll do my very best. But he goes over a couple of things. He brings up, let's go to, uh, before we go back to uh, accordance, let's go to logos. I want to put something up and let's look at this word here. We've got on the screen the word adakimus. Now this word adakimus, he gets from here. Let's pull this out. Let's move it up a little bit. And here's 1 Corinthians 9.27. And he says, but I discipline my body over to this right. I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have uh, preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. And for some reason, he wants to focus on the word adakimus. Now, this word adakimus is used a couple of other places. So let's find out where they are. One of the other places is 2 Corinthians 13, 6. Also in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, which by the way, he references that. So let's go to the passage and I want you to notice something and we'll come back to that passage in 1 Corinthians 9. But in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, which he, by the way, he brings up, let's go there. He says, test yourself to see if you are in the faith. Uh, examine yourselves or do you not recognize that this about yourselves, about that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test. And the word here is adakamoi. Well, we want to make sure those in this case that are the adakamoi, those that are that are uh, that have failed, then those aren't saved. So he says, make sure, make sure. Notice what he said. Make sure that you are. But I trust that you will realize that we ourselves do not fail the test. We ourselves, believers, are not adakamus. And the word that's used there, uh, uk esmen, we, not we are adakamoi. So one. Paul is referring to who? Those believers who are certainly believers and they're generic believers. We don't know the names, but included in that, who is included in this statement that Paul is making in 2 Corinthians 13? They don't bring that up. Who is Paul bring? Who does Paul include? Well, Paul has to be including himself. Why? How do we know that Paul is including himself, that he knows for a fact that he's not uh, of the adakimus? Because he says esmen, that is, that is a, uh, a first person plural pronoun, we, we are not uk esmen adakimus. So Paul is including himself. Why is that important? Because you just got through hearing them say that Paul of all people had to have considered that himself could have actually have been forfeited or have forfeited his salvation. Look what Paul says though. One, we know Paul's not going to forfeit his salvation. One, how do we know? Because Jesus literally told him that. He's told when he meets Jesus, 
what's going to happen to him. He's told, he, Paul knows he is going to heaven. Paul knows for a fact, as a matter of fact, it's the very same Paul who was brought to heaven um, in a vision. We'll talk about that. That pastor is going to come up again as well. But so Paul knows what his future is and that he's going to suffer many things for Christ's sake. So Paul knows for a fact because he was he got it straight from the horse's mouth, or I should say straight from the Lord's mouth about his destiny. But notice what Paul is saying, and I want you all to see if Paul is saying that he could possibly, Paul could possibly be disqualified. He says, do you not know that those who run a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Now, obviously, Paul is not saying that only one person is going to be saved, but he says we all run knowing that only one person is going to win the race. Look what he says, um, but only one receives a prize, so run in such a way that you may win. So he's saying, I want you to run this way. Run in such a way. This word right here, hutos, important word. Matter of fact, in John 3, 16, says, this is how, so in this way, so run in this way. Paul is saying, I want you to run this way. Okay, very important uh, that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. Then they do it to receive a perishable wreath. But we, an imperishable wreath. Now, he's obviously not saying that only one person, only one person is going to get the prize. Only one person is going to be saved. Let's pay attention to what Paul is trying to say. Paul is saying, therefore, I run in, there's that word again, look on the right side, highlighted, hutos. I'm going to run like this. How is Paul going to run, ladies and gentlemen? He tells us, as not without aim, I box in such a way uh, as not beating the air. That's not how I'm going to run. But I discipline my body to make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. So Paul is saying, I'm going to run like that. I'm going to run that way as though I could be disqualified. Paul already knows that he's not going to be. As a matter of fact, he goes on to say, using the very same word, he says it in 2 Corinthians. He's already been told that way. So all Paul is telling you is how he's going to run. Oh, by the way, how you ought to run, how we all ought to run. Amen. Now, they're going to bring up another passage. So let's go to this other passage. This is Romans. I had to look down and make sure I was looking at the right one. Romans chapter 11, 22. Now, obviously, and we're not going to cover every single passage they cover. We, we just can't. And we can't cover every single passage that somebody might want to cover. But we'll have time at the end if someone has a question. Hey, Corey, what about this passage? What about that passage? Because again, I'm going to give you some passages and I'm going to cover. They had the audacity to bring up some passages that I happen to love and they butchered them. And I know they didn't do so intentionally, but whether they did intentionally or not, they did. In Romans chapter 11, Paul makes very clear declarations that you can absolutely forfeit your salvation. Paul is giving a, a warning to believers that just as uh, Israel, we see, was, was cut off and the Gentiles were, were grafted in, it says we should not have any uh, reason to be boastful because it says we could also be cut off. But let me tell you, he says, you're only going to continue to be grafted in if you continue to trust, if you continue to to live in his goodness. If you don't, you'll be cut off just like they were. I don't see how you could state it any more clearly. But to you, kindness, if, there's a big if, if you continue in his kindness. Why does the Bible use the word if? It should, if it's once saved, always saved, it should say, you know, when. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. It's a, it's a guarantee. Uh, why does the Bible use the word if? So let's go to Romans 11, 22. Now, this is speaking of Paul has this issue with the fact that uh, a majority of believers are Gentiles. Not that that's a problem, but is that the Jews, that Israel, his brothers of the, of the flesh, as he says in chapter 9, the earlier part, I'm chapter 9, verse 1, and chapter 9, 10, and 11 are all about the same thought about Israel. And so, and so he, that's his whole point. Now, here... He's speaking about how Israel, how Jews have been cut off. And now he tells us there's a partial hardening that has come. There's a spirit of stupor been given to them, a partial hardening. They are being made jealous in order to bring the, uh, uh, the, the Jews are being made jealous by bringing the Gentiles in. And then eventually they will be brought back in. That's very important. He says, but you will say uh, then that branches were, were, I'm sorry, broken off so that I might be grafted in. 
which is correct, quite right. They were broken off for their unbelief. They didn't believe. It's not that they believed and stopped believing. They did not believe. As And how do we know so? Because all we have to do is go back to the Old Testament. They were not believing people. But God says that I will remember my promise that I made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The promise that I made, this covenant that I made, I'm going to remember. Not because of you. You guys don't deserve anything. You guys deserve dirt and fire. That's what you deserve. But so, and people will look and see, God has done this to his people and has brought down his own house, but he will not let the Israel and his people be a byword. He will save them in the future. But how is he going to do it? By making them jealous, by doing what? As he says in Hosea, as we were talked about in Deuteronomy and Leviticus and so forth, he's going to call a people that are not his people to be a people, a nation that's not a nation to be his, and in turn, make them jealous. So let's continue. Quite right, they were broken off for their unbelief, but you stand by your faith. Do not be conceited just like they were. Don't be conceited like the Jews who thought that our righteousness was one because of who we are. And we have folks like that too. Don't we have people, tell me, ladies and gentlemen, do we have people who are boastful about their salvation or their perceived salvation, who feel as though you can lose your salvation, but I can't. Everyone else can lose their salvation. Listen, guys, keep working, keep this, keep that, um, keep praying, keep fasting, keep reading, keep believing, keep following, so you don't lose your salvation. However, I won't. Proof positive that I won't is that I'm here. Paul says, don't get like that. Do not, don't get like that. And we're going to see this even more so, but let's go back to the passage. He says, do not be conceited, but fear. For if God, now he's relating this to being conceited, for if... That's what we have here, gar if, gar a, for if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. You know why he didn't spare the natural branches? Do you think that he cut off any, now he's speaking holistically of Israel. Do you think that he cut off any Jews who were believing? Clearly he didn't cut off any Jews who were believing. So he cut off Jews who didn't believe, which was the overwhelming majority of Jews who didn't believe. As a matter of fact, Jesus shows up. He says, I came to my own and my own did not receive me. So the overwhelming majority of Jews did not believe. Don't be like them. I, he says, if I didn't spare, if he didn't spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Behold the kindness and severity of God to those who fail severity. But to you, by the, who, by the way, who's the those who fail? That's the Jews. And it was prophesied that they would do so. Even during Jesus's day, how was Jesus, ladies and gentlemen, see if you remember this, how was Jesus speaking to the Jews at that day? After they said, what you're doing, you're doing by the power of the devil, by the power of Beelzebub. Then Jesus says, you know what? Glad you said that. Now we can get on with the program because I've stated in Isaiah and other places that I will speak to these people in parables, having eyes they don't see, having ears they don't hear. That's his whole point that he's made, that, that's being brought up and fleshed out right here. And so uh, they fail not because they were great, wonderful people or that they used to believe. We don't have these Jews as used to believing and now they're not. No, but he came to them presented themselves, and they were offended. He became a stumbling stone to them. He says, so, continuing, he says, but to you, God's kindness. Now, he says, if you believe, and so it's definitely if, if you believe. Should we have a problem with someone saying, well, you can, you'll, you'll be saved if you continue in his kindness? We shouldn't have a problem with that at all. I'll tell you why in a second. Otherwise, you'll be cut off. And they also, if they if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. A couple things. One, they will be grafted back in because as a nation, the nation will not continue in their unbelief. For God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree. Now, I don't want to continue reading, but he said he's going to bring them back in. Now, the point is they make a big issue out of the if, out of the if. Why do you make a big deal out of the if? There is no reason to make a big deal out of the if, if you continue. Where does that, how does that bother us? There's two passages that we can look at. John 15, now, depending upon which camp you're in, some folks believe that all of John 15 is only for the uh, the disciples, fine, but it keeps being brought up. 
that John 15 says that you must remain. If you don't remain, then you will be cut off. If you don't remain and bear fruit, you will be cut off, withered up, gathered together and thrown in the fire. But as we go further, he says that, but I have appointed you. I've placed it so that you will remain and bear fruit. So he stated that you will. So now understand, ladies and gentlemen, it is possible for a person to believe today and stop believing tomorrow. As a matter of fact, we see that nowadays they even have a fancy term for it. It's called deconstruction where someone, you know what? I, I, I believe that Jesus is the only way. Went to church, went to had went on Easter egg hunts, had my Sunday uh, uh, shoes and, and slacks and jackets and so forth. And the girls had on their Sunday dresses. But now I don't believe that. Now I believe there's more than one way. As a matter of fact, I believe if you are a good, clean living Muslim or Hindu or Buddhist or heck, even a good, clean living atheist, I believe God's going to honor that. So that person used to believe the tenets of the faith. And what we're going to find out is every time in the Bible that we see where someone has left the Bible, never, ever, 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 not once says they left from believing. You're going to notice the difference between the verb and the noun. Not one time does the Bible speak of someone stop believing, but about someone leaving the belief, not having faith, but leaving the faith. Are you with me so far? So we don't have a problem with the if. The if indicates if indeed you are a Christian, because if you are a Christian, what are you going to do? You're going to keep believing. If you are a believer, you're going to keep believing. You're going to keep following. You're going to keep hearing. That is, if you are. No wonder Paul and others have all of these warning passages. If you guys are, as a matter of fact, where did the first if, so to speak, come from? Well, Jesus said so. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, I've done all these things. Matter of fact, I went to the right church. I was the I was a deacon. I was an usher. I was all these different things. And what did what does Jesus say? Well, I used to know you, but you stopped believing. So now I don't know you anymore. No, he says, I never knew you. I never knew you. That's the key point. So we're not bothered by Romans chapter 11. Uh, at all. As a matter of fact, it makes perfectly good sense. So now to the next one, he makes a statement and I think he needs to take his own his own uh, medicine or his own words on this. I encourage the, the, anybody who's listening to this, look at what the text says. Quit trying to explain it away in view of a theology that you want to uphold. Uphold the word of God and change your theology. I agree with that. I agree with that wholeheartedly. So watch what they do when we go to Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10 they are going to instead insert their theology in the text. So as we're going to Hebrews, ladies and gentlemen, who is Hebrews written to? Pretty easy to understand to the Hebrews or to the Jews, even though the text doesn't say, uh, it doesn't say to the, to the Jews who are in so-and-so, but it's clear that this letter is written to Jews. Everything that's brought up about the old covenant, about the high priest and the offerings. And you're going to hear this, hear them bringing out and fleshing out uh, a better high priest a better uh, scapegoat, and a better sacrifice. And there's a big difference. So before we continue, I just want to make sure you understand. I've said this before. Someone says, well, what's a good way to learn how to uh, memorize scriptures? And I said, well, before you think about memorizing scriptures, I would much rather you memorize the story. Why? Because if you memorize the story, you know exactly what's happening. You don't watch a movie that way. You don't watch a series or read a book that way where you're going to focus on a particular text or something they say. You focus on what's happening. So when it happens, you know why it's happening and what's going to happen later. So in this case, we know what has happened to Israel. We know that they have that, that God has given this atonement for mankind. Even if you're not Jewish, if you're not part of Israel, you could still participate in it. You can still be numbered amongst them if you adhere to God's commands. The problem is mankind doesn't like to always obey. Why? Because we got this flesh, we want to do our own thing. And even if we want to do our own thing, we got this heart, this inward man that just likes to do our own thing. And so what we're going to have here is we're going to have them looking not at the text. We're going to look at them putting their belief in the text. And this is why they come to a bad, matter of fact, they're going to say something that is kind of contradictory. 
6, having fallen away, it's impossible to renew them again to repentance, since they again crucified to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. The idea that we could be beyond retrieval reminds us of Proverbs 29. Someone can be rebuked and uh, stiff-necked. After so many rebukes, he can get to the point where he's broken. Be I need you to understand what's happening. What he's saying is, and what they're all saying, you can get so far gone into sin, there is no hope. This is how they're going to read Hebrews 6, 4 through 6. So let's run to it real quick. Let's put it on the screen. And as a matter of fact, let me back up. Okay. Hebrews 6, 4. For in the case of those who have once been, been alienated or enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age come. Now, ladies and gentlemen, just say this because some folks might want to say he's not talking about Christians. He absolutely is talking about Christians. These are believers. But what kind of believers is important? Now, does this also, can it relate to us? Sure it does. Without question, it relates to us. But his primary audience is to Jews. That's why you have all this Jewish imagery from the beginning to the end. So he's speaking to them. What do the Jews want to do? What do they know? What, what has their history been for thousands of years? It has been these offerings. The Day of Atonement, which we're going to talk about, the Old Covenant or the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, and these, these offerings throughout the year to atone for sin, to, me, to, to make up for our mess-ups. Okay? And so what he's saying here is, now this is my interpretation. We're going to see if I'm right and we're going to see if they're right. My interpretation is he's trying to, if you could fall away, then you can't come back. Now, he's going to tell them what he thinks about them. He is writing to them. He's telling them what he thinks about them, that you are not what, what, what you think you are. You are not in a position to where you have to worry about having to atone for your sin year after year. As a matter of fact, as you get to Hebrews 7 and Hebrews 8 and Hebrews 9 and Hebrews 10, we skip all of that and go to two passages in Hebrews 10 and forget all that we read in the, in the previous four chapters. And, and by the way, going into Hebrews 11 as well, forgetting what was just been stated. So all of this, the problem that the Jews have is they're stuck wanting to go back to the old way thinking, well, wait a minute, we had all these offerings. We had the Day of Atonement. As a matter of fact, that was a downfall for some of the people through the Judaizers in Galatians 5. I mean, Galatians um, the entire book of Galatians. So here, what he's saying is you're not going to, that if you could lose it, if you could lose your salvation, you can't get it back. Why do I say so? Because look what he says. And then having fallen away. Now they say, well, see, falling away is possible. Falling away is right there. So therefore you can fall away. But then it says it's impossible to renew them again to repentance. So we say, well, wait a second, if it's impossible to bring you back, who's teaching that if you lose your salvation, you can't come back? So how do they fix that? They fix it by saying, the way they fix it is by saying, the people that have fallen away, these are folks that are just so bad, so messed up, they can't be redeemed. I've got a question for you guys in just a little bit to answer that question. Tell me what you think. Beyond the possibility of change. That's a scary passage. Every day that you uh, sin is a day that you are getting closer and closer to that point of reprobation. Now, before we go to Hebrews 10, I'm, I want to ask you guys a question. I want you. I want to ask you guys a question. By the way, moderators, if you happen to see someone with a question, um, alert me so that I can go ahead and, and, and put it on. Or, or get to it. But I want to ask you guys a question. This is for everyone. This is for those that believe you can lose your salvation and cannot. And when we say lose your salvation, please, I don't want to hear the, it's not like a set of car keys. You can miss, that's not what we're talking about. If you believe that you can be saved today and not saved tomorrow, or believe you can be saved today and you'll always be saved. So whichever side of the aisle you're on, here's my question. And I, I want to read this to you because either this is talking about verses chapter six and verses 10, chapter 10, Either this is talking about a person who understands and still rejects it as true, that is the only source of salvation, or he understands it and loves sin so much that he can never come back. In other words, he doesn't care. So only two people. 
someone who that's what 10 is going to be. And that's and, and also six is in play. If you believe that a person gets so messed up, so bad, so bad that they can never come back. We got a question. We got a, we got an issue. Name the person that you know or you think. Don't name it in the chats. But name the person or think of a person that you that that, that you know that's irredeemable. Somebody out there, that person can't, he can't possibly be saved. Do you know of the person out there that cannot possibly be, God can't touch that person no matter what. Matter of fact, I'm pretty sure some of you guys, the six, seven folks in the chats right now, some of you folks are, wait a minute, I was that person. I was that person that no one thought I could be caught, I could be touched. No, listen, I myself even thought I'm so far gone, I can't be saved. Do you know what I've done? What kind of church preaches? I'm just, I'm, I want to ask all of these learned, esteemed men, what kind of church preaches to somebody, you're so far gone, God is through with you? Who preaches that? If you preach that, stop preaching. Now, is, are there some people that God has determined I'm not going to mess with? Sure. Do we know them? No, we don't. That person is a reprobate. Says who? Only God knows that. You don't know that. You don't know that. So today, and I mean today. So is he speaking about someone who is sin, has they've sinned so much that they can't, you because it keeps the more you sin, 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 the, more you sin, the less likely you can you can be saved. Now I don't know if it's true if Jeffrey Dahmer actually placed his faith in Christ. I don't know if he did or didn't. There were some that gave a testimony that he did, but again, it's in prison. So we don't know. We don't know. But if he did, what an awesome testimony. And if he did, isn't that something to, 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 to praise God for? And I don't know if he did or didn't. I don't know. But there are people who were just as bad. I, I know some. I met some. Ministered to some. Prayed with some who were so far gone. So far gone. The only reason why they didn't do what Jeffrey Dahmer did, they didn't have the opportunity. I've seen some people that are just just the, the worst of the worst you would think, and now they praise God. I talked about a guy named Martinez who is uh, at Beaumont, and I don't know if he's been moved or not, um, or something may have happened to him, but he's got a bunch of life sentences, and all he's doing is walking around telling any and everybody who will listen about Jesus. He is so feeling his testimony. He said, I've done so many things, killed some people, done some things, took advantage of young folk, young ladies, because, you know, in the, in the drug gang, uh, if you if you happen to get you a, a, a nice young sweet 15 or 16 year old that's not really being a sex offender even though we know better but he's, he's he's recounting all the filthy horrible things he's done to family members and friends just vile things you're gonna tell me that that's that he he sinned so and who determines what point of sin you've gotten to to where you can't only God can know that and so Paul couldn't be addressing that what Paul is addressing is a person who has rejected in their head that ain't the way Jesus ain't the way. There's other ways. So I want to continue, but I, I want I wanted to bring that up because that doesn't even make sense. We can't, you know, we can't do, we can't even preach that to someone if indeed that if we believe that. Because then what we're gonna start doing, we're gonna start judging folks and you know what? Yeah, he's done too much. He can't come back. Trampled underfoot the Son of God and treated the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified as unclean and has insulted the Holy Spirit. It's an a fortiori argument. If the Old Testament people of God could lose their salvation, given the greater privilege we have in the gospel, how much more severely would God deal with us? You get I want you guys to think about what he just said. He said an a fortiori argument, meaning uh, the extent of it is greater now than it was then. Well, let's think about that for a second. Let's think about that for a second. Let's think about what it was like in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant at that time. I, I want to fix something really, really briefly. What, let, let's think about what it was like under the Old Covenant. Do you all understand what the situation was for those in the Old Covenant? Because that's what these Jews know. The situation was for the Jews, apparently, listening to them, apparently the situation under the Old Covenant is the exact same situation it is now. 
Why would you say that, Corey? We've had Jesus that got on the cross and died and shed his wonderful blood. Yeah, but under the old covenant, with the blood of bulls and goats, just regular old animals, you can be redeemed today. You can be justified today and then not be justified next week, next month, next year. In other words, there was temporary atonement. Or to put it in our modern vernacular, you could lose your salvation. You could be atoned for today and then later not be atoned for under the old covenant. Does, it, does everyone understand that? Now, there's no one with any sort of biblical understanding that will refute that. There's no such thing as um, a permanent atonement in the Old Testament. If you, if, you, if you were atoned for this year, that's no guarantee that next year or next month that you would be unatoned for. I mean, that you still be atoned for. It was a year after year after year. As a matter of fact, in Hebrews 10, that's the whole point. There used to be this reminder year after year. And so if that's what it was then, then here comes Christ, who is a better high priest, who is a better um, sacrifice, and a better scapegoat. It's the, you, you mean to tell me it's the exact same thing? So what we should do is build us a spaceship. I'm sorry, not a spaceship, a time machine, go all the way back. 2,000, I'm sorry, 1,991 years and a few days and tell Jesus, don't get on that cross. No need. Don't get on the cross because you're just wasting your time, wasting blood, because if you die for us, we can still lose our salvation. I don't think they understand what salvation actually is. I don't think they realize that the reason why you go to hell and not to heaven, not to be with the Father, is because there's a debt that's incurred. I don't think they realize that your faith in the debt that's paid means there's no more debt owed ever. He's not going to come back and say, you know what? On second thought, Jesus, what I wanted, I need more. That's not what he's doing, but let's continue. You get this greater to lesser again, which we've been seeing over and over again throughout uh, the warnings in the New Testament that we're not to say, well, we're not under the law, so therefore we can commit apostasy over and over again in Hebrews chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 12. It's even worse to fall away under grace. Well, who is it saying it's impossible to renew again in repentance? Not everybody that falls away. The scriptures are very clear that branches were broken off. Romans 11 can be grafted back in again. James chapter 5, that if you bring one who... By the way, he doesn't know. He said, well, who can be, well, not everybody. He doesn't even know, but he's trying to make it fit. One who has turned from the truth back, he'll save a soul from death and hide a multitude of sins. The prodigal son came back and he was lost, but now he's found, he was dead, but now he's alive. That's all over the scripture. I think the ISV brings it out really, really well because it brings out the present tense participle so long as they continue to crucify the son of God afresh. I like what someone says, says people on both sides of the, of the conversation are sinning just fine. Amen. And so, again, that goes back to the, the, to the comment that that particular gentleman made at the beginning, that the, the problem with the world is laid at the feet of the people that believe that you can lose your salvation. So, so we're the cause. We're the reasons why. What about somebody like myself who didn't always, I used to believe that you could lose your salvation. So am I, am I partially responsible for the way the world is? Maybe. But let's go to this passage. Hebrews 10, 26. For if we go on sinning willfully... After receiving the, there's that word. I said that every time we talk about someone being removed or possibly losing what it looks like their salvation or falling away or apostasy, it's always away from knowledge, what we know. That's why Paul on his deathbed, as he's getting ready to get his head chopped off, he says that I have kept the what? Kept kept having faith? No, he used the noun. I have kept the faith. So, so if we go on sinning, Willfully after receiving what? The knowledge. Not after receiving the Holy Spirit. Not after receiving the knowledge of the truth. There no longer remains a sacrifice. In other words, if you know that this way is the way of salvation and you are not for it, there's, there is no sacrifice for you. There is no salvation. But what you can expect is a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversary. Anyone now, if you did that for the law of Moses, you were in trouble, even more so if you do that for what Christ has done. Folks who have trampled underfoot the blood of Christ, you have insulted the spirit of grace, giving you this as a means for permanent salvation, and you insulted. Do y'all realize what the Bible says in John 3 16? Says that uh, for God so loved the world, 
Now, he didn't, he didn't send his son into the world because he loves the world. The next passage tells us this, uh, that he gave his only begotten or the only one of his kind. And in this phrase, henna, in order that those that are believing, in order that the believing ones shall not perish. So why did he come? In order that the ones that are believing shall not perish. The reason, the problem was under the old, if you were believing, you could still perish because you're believing today and not believing tomorrow. We've got a problem with man and it's his heart. We'll come to that in a little bit, but doesn't he tell us, doesn't Paul tell us, not Paul, I'm sorry, not Paul, the writer of Hebrews, doesn't he go on and tell us that this is not us? Doesn't he go on and say, but uh, we are not of those who shrink back to destruction. So he's pointing to whoever these believers are, he's pointing and saying, these are not, we are not those who shrink back. Now he's going to make a statement. He's going to make a statement that just, that le they're going to make a statement that leaves me scratching my head. If we find in ourselves a numb heart, a desire not to obey, we should take heed to these warning passages and turn our hearts toward God until we hear the voice of God again. How? 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 If we find, if, if we are, if we're in this, because you, are, are you saying the exact same thing for the person who has, because you said it, you sin more. The more you sin, the further you get away and, and, and you find yourself in a place where you're irredeemable. Well, then how, how can you, how can you come back? How, how, how could you possibly come back? Because what you're saying makes no sense. Now they're going to go to a passage that I had a conversation with a, with a young man, older man about, and they brought this up. And so I would like to hear you all. I want you to hear them say something. And I want you to see if you hear the absence of a word. They're going to, we're going to, I'll tell you where it is. They're going to James 5, 19. And I want you to notice, matter of fact, let's go to the passage first. I want you guys to hear this first. This is, I think this is kind of, I think this is neat how they do this. They go to this particular passage and in going to this passage, I think they were wrong. I, th I think they were really wrong for what they just did. So let's go to the passage. James 5, 19, my brother. If any among you strays away from the truth and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the air of his ways will save his soul from death and will cover most of the sin. Now, this was a passage I used to have problems with. I used to believe that this passage, this, this passage that gave me a lot of problems. See, this says that uh, you can turn away from the truth. If you turn, if anyone strays away from the truth, so that means you can, you can walk, you can lose, you, you can lose salvation, you can walk away. Now, what if I said this? What if I said, if I read this, it says, brethren, if any of you strays away from the truth, does it, does it say that? Brethren, if any of you strays away from the truth, the reason why I ask that question is because they are getting ready to the exact same thing. It doesn't say if any of you, it says any among you, but let's play them and notice them taking the among you off. And there's a reason why. James is yet another incredibly clear passage about forfeiture of salvation, a strong warning. And James in chapter 5, verses 19 and 20, he says, brethren, he's talking to brethren, genuine believers. And he says, brethren, if any of you turn from the truth, in other words, they're in the truth, and one converts him, and he says, notice what he says. He didn't say if any among you, he says, if any of you. Any of you turn from the truth. In other words, they're in the truth and one converts him back. He'll save a soul from death and hide a multitude of sins. Now, some would say, well, James was written to Jewish believers, but also to Jewish seekers. But when we refer to them as brothers, and then says this, if one of you strays from the truth and another brings him back. So this is. And that's what he says. If one of you strays, if one of you strays from the truth. The problem with this passage is let's let's go back and I'm having to do all this juggling. I got all these different scriptures up. But notice what the text says. It didn't say if any of you, it says any among you, and who men. And who men is there for a reason. If any among you. James could have simply said, if he wants to include you, he could have said of any of you or of any out of you. Ek, if that word was there. But he says, and who men, and who men, which is if any among you. I think that's vitally important. As a matter of fact, Dr. Brown and I had this very same conversation and he himself, when I asked him, J James, <laughs> Dr. Brown, if this doesn't say what I say, how would you say it? How would the writer 
have to say if any among you, if he didn't want, if, if the writer didn't mean, if the writer, my way of looking at it is that the writer is not, James is not talking about the brethren. He's talking about those amongst the brethren. And so he says, I disagree with you. Well, fine. If you disagree with me, that's fine. I could be wrong. How would you write it then? How would you write it either in English or in Greek? How would it be written to speak of the brethren, of people amongst the brethren? This is someone who is in the Lord. Yeah, the, the language of James is so simple. Look in verse 13. Is any among you in trouble? You're, you're reading among you, trying to read something into the words, the exact opposite of what he's saying. Um, the, those among you are the believers. Is any among, among you, you in trouble? Among you. Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is any among you sick? So he, every time he's saying among you, just a few verses either, brothers and sisters, those among you, those among you, those among you. So this is the whole point. My brothers, if, if one of those among you should wander from the truth, this, he's making it explicitly clear, not just calling why him a brother. Then but, why but he's, he's saying. Now, here it comes. He's getting ready to say that. Some of you saw this the other day, um, but listen to what he says. He's actually going to say, he's actually going to catch himself saying what I said. That's how you ought to say it. And he stops and moves on. It's the exact same Greek. Is, is any sick among you? Right? Mm -hmm. Is anyone among you in trouble? Does one, does, does one among you leave? Here's how you get them back. Of course, he's writing to believers. You, you, how you would, turn how, how would, the, the meaning of the Greek completely upside down to make it the opposite of what it means. You're saying I'm turning upside down. So let me ask you this question. How would you write it in the Greek to refer to someone who's not a believer? How would you write in the Greek? How would you write to the believers how to deal with the non-believers among you? How would you write it? You'd say some among, you'd say some among, you'd say some among, you'd say some among, I'm, I'm not going to say it in Greek because I, I don't uh, speak uh, biblical Greek, etc. I do it in Hebrew if you want, but that's not going to help us. But you just say, there are some among you who claim to be believers and are not. So he already said, how would you say it? You would say if any among you, and then he caught himself because that's how you would say it. If you want to indicate those amongst the brethren, you would say any among. Now, I didn't catch this at the time which is why I did the video later. I didn't catch it, catch it at the time because, you know, you're going through your notes and so forth and you're paying attention, you look at the camera. But he said exactly what, how would you indicate that James 519 means if any amongst you, not brethren, you would say it among you the same way you would in James 513 because James 513 and so forth is not speaking of a physical sickness, but a spiritual sickness because the same word can be used spiritually and physically. And if it's a physical sickness, then that means that every single person that is prayed for by faith will be healed according to the text. But we know that doesn't happen. So it couldn't be that God is lying, that James is lying here. Well, he's not. He's re not referring to a physical healing because we've seen that people in the Bible did not get healed. Even at Paul's hand did not get healed like Timothy, Trophimus and so forth. And so it can only be for it to be true. It can only be for a spiritual healing that if you pray the prayer of faith, then you shall be. So if any amongst you brethren who is uh, uh, sick spiritually or any amongst you strays from the truth. Now, notice in 519, notice what they're straying from. Turns from the truth. There it is. Every time we see this, ladies and gentlemen, for those of you all who disagree, I want you to just remember this. Even if you got to go back and look for it later. Every time that someone seems to stray away or fall away, what are they falling away from? Not from having faith, but from the faith, you know, the tenets of the faith, not from believing, but from the belief, the tenets of the belief, the gospel and so forth. That's every time we see someone moving away from something, they're moving away from that. That part is vitally important, very important. Now, what they're going to do next is they're going to start covering um, some passages that seem to say, and we're going to look at how they they, wow, what they do with these passages, what they add to the text is, I think, downright a shame. Revelation 3, 5. If you overcome, you'll be clothed in white garments. I will not erase your name from the book of life. Now, just look at this possibility that your name can be erased from the book of life. Yes, you're Christians now, but if you do this, this, and this in terms of belief and behavior, well, your name can be erased from the Lamb's book of eternal life. They say, oh, my name's in the book of life. It'll be there forever. Well, is Jesus telling a lie here? Is he 
making an empty threat? If you overcome, your name will never be erased from the book of life. What if you don't overcome? That's a good question. What if you don't overcome? We'll deal with that in just a second. But let's go to the passage. Revelation 3, 5. Did you notice what he said? They, and they all said this. So I'll just, you know, in your spare time, if you want to go back and watch the, the, uh, the documentary. Did you notice what they added? They added something to the text. They added something to the text that's not there. What they did was they added a condition. They said that if you overcome, let me just play it one more time because I don't want you to just take my word for it. I want you to hear it. Revelation 3, 5. If you overcome, you'll be clothed in white garment. Now, so did you catch it? He says, if you overcome, if you overcome, so let's go back to, to the text, is the word if there. The word if is not there. Now, they like to use the Greek in the text, which is fine. makes me feel wonderful. So we can go ahead and use the Greek as well. The word if is not there. There is no condition right there. As a matter of fact, it's a declaration. The indicative is that the person that's overcoming. Now, does it say that you have to overcome? If you overcome, you better overcome. No. <clears throat> Excuse me. He calls us overcomers. This word right here is ha nikon. This is a participle. He calls us overcoming. We'll come back to the overcoming ones in just a second. But he's declaring to the overcoming ones what's going to happen. To you overcoming ones, uh, you will be thus clothed in white garments. And notice what he says. I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Now, I want you to do something. Over here on the right-hand side, a little real quick Greek lesson, you have what's called a double negation of, ladies and gentlemen, of a future active indicative. One of the strongest ways that you can actually negate something. So if it says in the future, if it says in the future that a future act, then you give what's called a double negation. In this case, ooh, which means no, not never. And then also may means not same thing. So if you put that prior to what's going to happen, a future action, for example, if I say I will run, and then I put before that in Greek, a double negation, it's the most emphatic way to say that this will never, ever in the future happen. It cannot happen. Perish the thought. And so we have this ume exalipso, which means it can never happen. You will never. Jesus, so, had, so, so the man asked this question. He said, did Jesus lie? No, he didn't. Jesus told the truth. Jesus is saying, you can never, ever perish. Who? Can, I'm sorry, you can never have your name blotted out. Who can never have their name blotted out? The overcoming ones. Well, ladies and gentlemen, who are the overcoming ones? I'll tell you. Let's go to the text. Let's go to 1 John 5. And let's see who are the overcoming ones. No, sir. Someone says it says he who overcomes. It does not. There is a reason why I have the Greek. And, and, and I want you guys to be a favor. There is a reason why I have the Greek on the text. That way, even if you don't know Greek, you can go back and compare my homework to someone else. You can go find it in your local Greek scholar. You can find someone on YouTube. Ask that person. Is that what that means? Matter of fact, let's go back to it. Let's go back to it because I don't want you guys to miss this. I want you to see what they did. Not, I didn't take away from the text. I did not add to the text. I simply put in what it actually says. Revelation 3, 5. This word is the overcoming one. Overcomes. That's what this word is. This is the, this is a, excuse me, present active participle. In English, if a person is in the category of a present active participle, if I say that you are a, uh, if you are the running one, that means that's what you are doing. You're in a state of running. So he didn't say if, or it didn't say he who overcomes. It's the, now I understand what the English says. So we go to the Greek. So we go to the Greek and the Greek says the, the ones that are overcoming. Now let's go back to 1 John and let's find out because it's, if that's what it means, we need to go back and find out well, who exactly are the overcoming ones. Here's what it says. Whoever believes, by the way, the, again, this is where this is where I would I would say, guys, I would love for you to just get a, just a little bit of Greek. Look what it says. Now, on the English, it says whoever believes. The whoever, well, we, we're, we're doing the best we can with our English, but the word is pas hapistuan, our favorite word on this channel. All of, the word is pas, look at the bottom, all of, all each ever of the ones that are believing. All of the believing ones. Are you believing? If you are a believing one, this is you. If you are a believing one, then you can shout. If you guys are 
charismatic Pentecostal, you can really shout on this one. Look what he says. All of the believing ones in Christ, which is born of God, and whoever loves a father loves a child. So if you are if you are truly a Christian, you also love the brothers. And look what he says. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe his commandments. Well, that's a problem because we don't always seem to want to observe his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Look what he says. For whatever or whoever the word pond is here, this word pon. So all of, because all the ones this word that have been born, the word is gegenemanon. I know it's a kind of multi-syllable Greek word, but all of the ones, it's in the perfect tense. By the way, by the way, it's in the perfect middle tense. What does that mean? Perfect tense, middle voice. Mean if it's in the middle, you didn't do it. You didn't born yourself. I know it's bad clunky English, but you didn't born yourself. You didn't bear yourself. You didn't begot yourself. No, it's the it's the middle voice. It was done to you. It was done to you, my friend, and all the ones that it was done to. So all of the ones that have been born, and it's a perfect tense, means it's a completed action from the past, which tells us when you were born again. It doesn't mean that you were born again at the moment that you recognize it. No, it was it's a perfect tense. It's a past action from the past, a complete action from the past. I'm sorry. So all of the ones that are that are overcomers. I'm sorry, the ones, I'm sorry, all of the ones that have been born of God, they overcome the world. So who are the overcomers? The ones that are that have been born of God. And this is the overcoming. This is the one that overcomes uh, the world. This is what overcomes the world, our faith. Do you have faith in Christ? If you have faith in Christ, you have be, you are an overcomer. You're an overcomer because you are born again. How would you get to be born again? Good question. Glad you asked. Let's go ask, consult Peter. First Peter 1, he says, uh, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy, he didn't consult you or me or anyone else, according to his own great mercy, his own counsel, what does he say? He caused us to be born again. He caused us to be born again. It was him that did so. He caused us to be born again. So if you want to talk about someone being blotted out, it can't be us. Why? Because he caused us to be born again. Those that are born again, the born again ones, we're also the overcoming ones because as born again ones, the born again ones are also the believing ones. According to John three, according to John one, the believing ones are the ones that have been born again. The believing ones and born again are also the overcoming ones. So the overcoming ones, he says, will never be blotted out out. What is so difficult about that for these so-called scholars to get it? And I would say the same thing for anyone else. What is so difficult for anyone else? You have to intentionally ignore, you know what, Corey, I'm not listening. I'm li Now, if you don't have to believe me now, uh, as, as they used to say, the guys on uh, Saturday Night Live back in the 80s, uh, hear me now and believe me later, that's fine. Hear me now, believe me later, or hear me now, go check the text. It's, on, it's, it's, it's literally on YouTube, until YouTube blows up, the world blows up, it's there. You can go and listen to it, watch it, and compare it. You can go to Blue Letter Bible and say, okay, this is that. This is you can you can take your time and go over what the tense, the mood, the voice is, and see if what I'm saying is incorrect. See, there are some folks that either because you've been taught that way, which is fine, I get that. It's hard to get past what you've been taught, but then some folks are just arrogant that way. Some folks are so arrogant that that person can't be saved. That person can't be saved. But I am as wretched and dirty as I am. You don't know about it, so therefore I'm still saved in your eyes. But the rest of you folks, he can't be saved. Did you hear what John did? Did you hear what Mary did? Oh, he cheated on his wife. She's doing drugs. He stole some money. She did that. He ain't saved. Look at him. What Christian would do that? Uh, you. If you're in the position like the Pharisee that I thank God I'm not like that person, rest assured you are in the same position as those folks in Romans 11 who your, your conceit, your arrogance you are cut off because you temporarily believe. So let me ask you guys a question. Let me ask you guys a question. I'll go back to, to them. Your heart is the issue, is it not? What happens if the word, which is good, is sown in your heart? That matters. That matters, right? Well, how much does it matter? I'll show you how much it matters. It matters this much. Jesus gives a parable of the sowers, the seed in the soils. As we look at it, and I love using this because this one, this is Jesus' words. He says, he says that the, the word, which is a seed, 
I don't care how good, I mean, I don't care how good the seed is, what you sow it in or on matters. I can have the I can have seed from from the greatest stock ever. If I go in my kitchen and plant that seed on top of that cheap floor, they'll come back and and and, and we'll wonder why hadn't it grown? What well, well, was the problem with the seed? No, it's not a problem with the seed, or I should say the word of God. It's a problem with the ground, with the soil that is sown in. He tells us, Jesus tells us that the soil is our heart. Ladies and gentlemen, before I, before I put the pass on the screen, how many of you can control your heart? You don't. You do not determine what condition your heart is. You will not find that pass. Although God asked you to, He says, "Circumcise your heart," but you won't. Which is why He says, "I will circumcise your heart." So Jesus in Luke chapter eight says that it's the person whose heart is a good heart that the seed is sown on. That person is the one um, that are going to receive it bear fruit. Now, there are those that believe temporarily. He says, verse 12, those beside the road are those who have heard the word. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart so that they will not believe and be saved. Then he says, those on the rocky soil uh, are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no firm root. They, look what he says, they believe for a while and in time of temptation, fall away. This, this Jesus stuff don't work. Problem is their heart. The seed which fell among the thorn, these are the ones who have heard it. And as they go on their way, they are choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this world. Verse 15, here it is. But the seed in the good soil, these are the ones, these are the ones who have heard the word in a what? Honest and good heart and hold it fast and bear fruit with perseverance. Well, that matters. That means something. What I just do? I pushed a button somewhere. That matters. That means something. I don't know what I just did. <laughs> so your heart is the issue. You don't do the heart. That's not that's not a you thing. As Jesus says, you have to be born from above. That means you are born from above, born of water and flesh. I mean, water and spirit, born of the spirit, born from above. That's all that that's what's required. You have you need a regenerated heart to keep believing. If you don't have a regenerated heart, you can believe temporarily, but that doesn't do you any good. So about the person, if they remain, if they keep believing, fine. We believe that. We believe that if you are saved, you will keep remaining. So let's continue. Let's go back to them. Now what they're going to do is they're going to offer some counter. Let me push the right one. Offer some counter arguments. I'm sorry. Let, let me let me let me let them finish with their Revelation three first. Comments. I will not erase your name from the book of life. Now, just look at this possibility that your name... Actually, I'm sorry. They, we, already, we already finished that. So let's go to the next one where they offer these counter arguments. And the counter arguments, they just, they, they fall. They fall flat. If we'll frequently point to Paul's words in Ephesians 1, that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. In Greek, seal is often, you know, a stamp, a seal of approval, a seal that a king puts on something that it belongs to him. Uh, and seals can be broken, stamps can be effaced. Everybody in Paul's world knew seals could be broken. There were seals on amphoras, wine jars. There were seals on documents. Now, before we continue, can a seal be broken? Sure, no problem. Even if you think that, because some folks think that the seal refers to um, being protected, you are sealed, can't be let out. Or it's a seal, a mark. Well, what have I always said? The mark, the identifying mark of a believer is what? The Holy Spirit. The identifying mark of a, of a believer is the Holy Spirit. And so he sets his seal on you. Here's a question, ladies and gentlemen. Here's a question that I want to ask. Hypothetically, we'll come back to it, but if the seal can be broken, who can break the seal? One, you didn't put the seal on. No man did. But who can break? You mean, can you break the seal? And we're going to have to go back and look at the text again to see what all he's speaking of. As a matter of fact, let's go to the text. Let's go to the text. He says, in you, you also, after having listened to the message, message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed the pistusantes, which is, by the way, this is a present active participle. I'm sorry, heiress active participle. So after having been believing, so you are believing, 
Remember, that's important because the Bible refers to believers in a state of believing. I won't cover that because that's, that's just too long to kind of get into, but we'll, we've covered it before. We may have to revisit it again. But having also believed or believing, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Fine. Don't have a problem with that. Who was given as a pledge. Now, this is where we get, this is where we get somewhere. Who was given as a, who gave you the Holy Spirit? As a promise, as a pledge, this word is Arabon. Who gave you that? Well, before we continue, let's go back and let them finish. They are going to uh, finish their point, and I think they, they, they miss it. The same thing for the word earnest, which unfortunately is sometimes translated as guarantee. But the word earnest is like earnest money. It means a down payment. So we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit, meaning we have received the Holy Spirit as an inheritance, as a deposit on what is to come. About four times, the Apostle Paul speaks of the Holy Spirit as the proof that we are saved. What is the evidence? Now, I want you to hear this. What he says, the evidence, the proof, the Holy Spirit, listen to what he says the, the Holy Spirit does. And it's like it's you're, you're pretty much contradicting or nullifying your previous points. That you are a Christian, the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, changing your affections, changing your desires, making you able to live the life of Christ in ways that were simply never possible before the cross. He is now. I think that's interesting. I I I think that's absolute. I want to pull up something. I mean, let me not mess up. I want to pull up something. I think that is absolutely interesting. I want to go there because he says the work of the Holy Spirit. What that his words? If I if I heard him correctly, the work of the Holy Spirit works in you and moves you and so forth. And did you, did you all catch that? You all in the live stream chats and you all in the comments, did you catch that? The reason why is because we agree. We agree. If it were not for the Holy Spirit and us having this seal and then him being in us, not on us, but in us, we couldn't live this life. But he puts the Holy Spirit in us. And what does he say? Let's go to the Old Testament. Uh, if you guys don't mind, let's go to the Old Testament. I, pull the, uh, I did. I pulled the right one up. So here we are in Jeremiah 32. Now, this is after Jeremiah 31, after he says what's going to happen in this, in this new covenant, and that, oh, by the way, he will, because of that, will no longer remember their sins anymore, except the ones that they're going to do later on. That's not what he says. We're going to do with that as well. So he says, Jeremiah 32, 39, he says, and I will give them one heart and one way. Remember, the problem with, with mankind is his heart. He's going to put his spirit in our hearts. Look what he says, that they may fear me always for their own good and for the good of their own children after them. I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them. I will not turn away from them to do them good. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts so that they will never turn away from me. So remember that I, God, will not turn away from them. And they, these people with the spirit in their hearts, will not turn away from him. Why is that going to be? Because the spirit is going to be in their heart. Ezekiel 36 he says, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful. This is a promise in the Old Testament of what he's going to do in the future. Here's the question. Did he do it? Not just won't he do it. He will. But did he do it? We saw that happening on the day of Pentecost, the spirit being poured out. And he says who he puts his spirit in. Look what he says, unless you guys think I'm help me out, make sure I'm not misreading the text. I will put my spirit within you. And this word cause you from the Hebrew word uh, asa, I will cause, make or do make you to walk in my statutes. So going off of what they just said in terms of the spirit being in you, moving in you, that's how it works. The Holy Spirit is going to move in you like he just said. Did you know that there are over 80? I'm sorry, I pushed her. Y'all forgive me. I pushed the wrong one. I'm sorry. I'll go back to it. He is not saying you can live any way you want in the meantime because you've been sealed. That would never be consistent with the teachings of Paul. Who says, who says that you, that I don't know anyone that's saying you can get saved and live how you want to live. Now, there are some, 
There are some, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. There are some that believe that. That's wrong. That's faulty. You can't get saved. And then I heard someone say that you can be, you can place your faith in Christ and then become a Muslim. No, you cannot. You can't place your faith in Christ and become a Muslim because you didn't place your faith in Christ. You gave a, a temporary mental assent. It's a good idea. I think I, you know, this week I like Jesus. I'm good. You know, on further thought, on further thought, further review, I think that Hinduism is right. On further, after further thought, I think that Islam is correct. Well, a person that does that, what do they just do? They left the tenets of the faith, the thought, what we know. So no one is saying that you can go out and live how you want to live. We're not saying that. Some Whoever teaches that is teaching a bad doctrine. The verse that you often hear from the once saved, always saved camp is uh, John 10, 27 to 28. He says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. And so they will say, uh, you know, you are once saved, always saved um, as, a, as a Christian because he gives you eternal life and you'll never perish. Because Now I want you to hear they're adding a condition. There's a condition. Oh, by the way, do you know how happy and excited I, I got when I saw that they went to John 10, 27, 28? Don't they know? <laughs> Don't they know that listen, anywhere on YouTube or Facebook, wherever, if you, if you, if you mangle John 10, 28, I'm coming. I'll, I'll be there in a second. Might not get there soon, but I'll get there eventually. They absolutely destroy the text. Why? Because they do what you're not supposed to. They add to the text. Listen to what he says. Because the sheep there are defined as those who follow Christ. The Greek present tense is used. They follow, continue to follow Christ. They believe in him. It's the Greek present tense again. They believe and continue to believe in him. In John 10, you have all these present indicative verbs. My sheep are hearing my voice. They are following me. The condition in this verse is when he says, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. Did you all hear the condition? We'll go back and look at the text. There is, and we've covered this before, there is no condition that says you must keep following in order to be a sheep. And if you keep following, then you're a sheep. And then that promise remains. But if you stop following, then you're no longer a sheep. There is no such condition. Rather, what we have is him stating that this is his sheep, him stating what his sheep do. Me. And so if you're no longer following Christ, if you're no longer following his voice, then you no longer have the promises of this verse. They follow me and I give them eternal life. What if you don't follow? Is that promise still going to be fulfilled? So now let's go to the text. I, I just, I, I just could not believe they went to that text. So let us do that. Let us go to that particular text. And which one are we on? We are on, okay, I just want to make sure I've got, I'm going to the right passage. So it says, my sheep, do you all see, let me know if you see an if, even in the English. If you see an if in the English, fine. By the way, the Greek, there is no such condition there. There is no such condition there, okay? Someone said, is that the cat? Yes, the cat came in, sniffed the, the, uh, the litter box and walked out. This, my cat is a jerk. He's not, my cat is not saved, or maybe he is. My cat can't lose his salvation. Anyway, he says, my sheep hear my voice. Ladies and gentlemen, is there a condition there? Or is he just stating what sheep do? My sheep hear my voice. Jesus also states, I know them. There's no condition thus far. And they follow me. Not if they follow me, but he says, he's stating this in the indicative, what sheep do. Sheep hear his voice and sheep follow him. So the question's got to be, ladies and gentlemen, are you a sheep? If you are a sheep, what will you do? Now, before we continue to verse 28, let's go back up to the very beginning of it and let's look at the point. Because he says, he, so he told us earlier not to just take the text. Let's, what, what did he say? Uh, I want to play him in his words. I don't, I don't want to just speak out of turn or say he said something he didn't. Encourage that the, anybody who's listening to this, look at what the text says. Quit trying to explain it away in view of a theology that you want to uphold. Uphold the word of God and change your theology. Amen. Amen. So let's go back to the text. Let's go to first, I mean, go to John 10. Let's start in verse three. We're going to be pretty quickly. We're going to start moving fast. To him, the doorkeeper opens and the sheep 
that's us, that's you, if you're a believer, the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep, Taidia Prophetai, which is the his own sheep, the sheep that belong to him. Question, how did he get those sheep? Well, Jesus tells us later on, or I'm sorry, earlier, he told us earlier that the sheep that are his, that are his own, were given to him by who? By the father. And all of those sheep, ladies and gentlemen, he is going to not lose one, but raise them up. But we'll come to that later, possibly. My sheep uh, calls, calls his own sheep and he leads them out. When he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them, goes ahead of who? His sheep. And what does he say the sheep do? By the way, keep looking out to see if there are any conditions. Does he say if you have to? No, he's stating what sheep do. So if a sheep lives a lifestyle of never following him, going astray, I don't mean that you go astray because we already talked, we, they already told us that you have good days and you have bad days, remember? And a steady growth. Put it back on the screen, I'm sorry. We will have some good days and some bad days, but the pattern of our life over time is faithfulness and a steady growth. So even as sheep will have ups and downs, ups and downs, sometimes we have uh, an extended um, time of having ups. Sometimes we'll have an extended amount of time of having some downs, right? But he's speaking of a sheep who don't always walk straight sometimes. And oh, by the way, if the sheep ever were to move away, what's going to happen? Now we're told that the sheep won't ever stray away once the spirit is in them. So some folks want to go to pastors where the sheep don't have the spirit in them. And he says, which of you having 99, 100 sheep and, and one leaves will not leave the 99 to go after the one. He's not speaking to folks that are saved yet. But even if you were, even if you were, what's he going to do? Go back after us, won't he? He just, he stated he will go back after us. He will not lose one. But going to this, he says, when he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them. And what does he say the sheep do, ladies and gentlemen? The sheep follow. Why do the sheep follow? This word is over here in the Greek. Let me highlight this. Hati means because. Why are sheep going to follow? Well, we see it in English because they, the sheep, know his voice. Now, the most emphatic way that you can say something again shows up here. A stranger, it says they simply will not follow. How does he say that? In the most emphatic way. Ume, akaluthesusin. Akaluthesusin is the is a subjunctive, meaning it, it conveys possibility. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it's not a, a, a subjunctive. This is a, a future active indicative. So they will follow. That's what akaluthesusin is. They will follow. So that's a, that's a problem. They will, will. But he puts a double negation in front of it. Ume, that means they will never, ever, ever follow a stranger or a strange voice. He even so nice to tell us why they won't follow a strange voice. He says, um, because we know his voice, but a stranger we will not follow. But what does he say we will do? He says we will flee. We will flee. So if you are a sheep, and a strange voice comes and says, deny Christ. A strange voice comes and says, stop believing. A strange voice comes and says, go after Islam. A strange voice says, go after Hebrew Israelitism or whatever. A strange voice goes up and says, follow Mormonism or what have you, Islam. You will not follow, but what will you do? You will flee. Why? Because a sheep don't know that voice. That's what he says. And if you think he's only talking about the Gentile sheep, no. Because he goes on his, I mean, the Jewish sheep, he goes on and said, there, there are sheep of another flock that I'll go and get them and the two flock, they'll become one. So let's go back to verse 27, 28, where they went to and they butchered the text because they added a condition. Aren't we told not to add or to take away from the text? Well, we certainly shouldn't add a condition that's not there. It doesn't say, if my sheep hear my voice, then I'll know them. That's not what's there. He says, he tells us what his sheep do. Sheep hear his voice. And he, and he knows him and we follow him. And what does he say? Now, here's the part that I asked Dr. Brown. I've asked other folks. It is the undefeated text of YouTube and the internet. It is the undefeated text in seminaries. It is the undefeated text amongst even the Greek scholars. Now, they can explain it away. They will do what um, scholars who disagree with this, what I'm going to say, they will do what we were seeing them do here. That is adding a condition. There is no condition there. If someone says there's a condition, I just simply say, fine, I'll defer. Just show me the condition. Show me the if. Show me the if then. But we don't see that. He says, 
in chapter two, I mean, verse 28, he says, I give them, we have three clauses, clause A, clause B, clause C, clause A, I give them eternal life, clause B, and they will never perish, clause C, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. If you can walk away, they'll say, well, then that means you can, that means you can walk, it doesn't say that you can snatch, some, no one can snatch you, but you can walk away. But God said, you'll never turn away from me. And Jesus says, they'll never, they'll, they'll keep following me and they'll never turn away. So Jesus says, so here, God makes a statement also in Jeremiah and in Ezekiel. And then these guys come back and they're beautifully done 4K documentary say that you can on your own. You can fall away. That means we'll have a contradiction between, at least with clause B and clause C, because clause B says, I will, I give them eternal life. Well, if they walk away, they don't have eternal life. And then clause B especially says that they will never perish. But even more so, this word that's used here, ume apolontai. Apolontai is a subjunctive. What is a subjunctive, ladies and gentlemen? That is when you say something that's possibly, it can possibly happen. So if you say no, no, ume, and then the subjunctive, the possibility, you say it's not even possible. And oh, by the way, the Greek rule is that it's not possible to happen in the future. So what, this is Jesus. And I think Jesus understands the words that he chose. Ume apolontai means that it can never, it's not even possible to happen in the future. Somebody should be shaking and shouting. Somebody should be, I don't know. Listen, here's your time. Go ahead. Speak in tongues if you want to. This is good stuff. He says that nobody, none of these sheep will ever, it's impossible for the sheep to perish in of any future act. And I added that part, any future act, because it's not me. That's what the Greek rule says. That's what the grammatical rule states. It's impossible for it to happen at any point in time in the future. So no one can come back and say, now what they have done is, well, here, go look at this scholar, go listen to that scholar. And that's, you know, you know what those scholars do? They said, well, see, if you're a sheep, that's not what it says. But fine, even if it said, if you're a sheep, aren't you a sheep? If you're a sheep, it's impossible for you to perish at any point in time in the future. The possibility is gone, is eliminated. So therefore, we don't have to listen to that. So the scriptures warn that you can harden your heart as a sheep and no longer hear his voice. Now, before we go there, what sheep in the Bible, where, where do we see that? There is no such passage that says we can harden our hearts as sheep. But anyway, now they're going to talk about Paul. Because Paul is so off. Paul doesn't sin. I want you all to think about what they're getting ready to say. Now, this is, in, this is their documentary. This is why they ought to pull the documentary down. Because they, they have been knocking their own legs out from under them. Remember they said this. They said earlier, if I'm correct, if I remember, they said that um, Paul was in fear of himself losing his own salvation. Paul, even Paul thought that he could lose his salvation. Even Paul thought that. Am I, am I wrong? Did you all, did you, those of you all, I know there are some folks that joined late, but those that were there earlier, we played the clip. If you haven't seen it, go back and play it. But they said Paul was even, because they went to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, that Paul could possibly, even Paul wasn't assured of his own salvation. Do y'all remember that? Please, in the chat, let me know if you all remember him saying, if you remember him playing that clip, the part about 1 Corinthians 9, that Paul wasn't even so sure. So we said Paul has to run a certain way to make sure that he makes it in. What can nullify all of their, and all of them said so, what can nullify that argument? Well, what would nullify that argument if you then come back and say that Paul doesn't have to worry about sin? Because if Paul didn't have to worry about sin, then why is he saying in 1 Corinthians 9 that he has to worry about sin? And what are they getting ready to say? Romans 7 is Paul saying that he has to, that he, ha he didn't have sin. That, that, that you, you want to do, you don't do, and that you live this kind of schizophrenic life, and then you recognize, I'm just a wretched sinner saved by grace, and then Romans 8, 1, there's no condemnation. Is that the way to read it? Or is Paul talking about life under the law before he knew the Lord? Well, is that really what Paul sounds like throughout the entire rest of the New Testament? Absolutely not. There is nothing in any of Paul's other letters that sound even remotely like Romans 7 as a paradigm or even a common experience in the Christian life. Now, here's the point they're making. When we read Romans 7, let's go and read Romans 7. Let's get to their point. Romans 7, Paul is dealing with um, the things he doesn't want to do, he does, and things that he don't want to do, he does. I'm sorry, things he wants to do, he doesn't do. 
he says, let's start, do we want to, um, start in verse 16. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing the laws, this is Romans 7, verse 17. So now no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. So is are they saying so they're saying that Paul is not saying that sin dwells in him. Paul is referring to his previous self before uh, while he was under the law. But this is but the current Paul doesn't have to struggle with sin. I'm saying, no, this is the current Paul at the time of his writing. They're saying, no, Paul didn't have to worry about sin or struggle with sin. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good I want, I do not do. But I practice the very evil that I want, I do not want to do. But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. So their point is, Paul, you can't go to that part because uh, Paul is not saying that he sins. Paul is referring to his old self. Again, they were the ones that brought up the Greek. These are all present active. These are all present active Greek verbs. And so he's not saying I used to be that way, the old me, because Paul's also used that pat. Uh, uh, language before the old me old things have been passed away all now things become new but paul still saying what he struggles with verse 21 i find then the principle that evil is present in me the one who wants to do good how could this be the old paul who wants to do good no this is right now for i joyfully con concur with the law of god in the inner man but i see a different law in in the members of my body waging war against me I'm war, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of the sin which is in my members. Wretched man that I am who will set me free from the body of this death. Thanks be to God through Christ Jesus our Lord. So then on the one hand, I, um, excuse me, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other hand with my flesh. So he's going back and saying, this is where I am. This is who I am. So their point is that Paul didn't struggle with sin well, then why would you make the point in 1 Corinthians 9 that Paul was or Paul was fearful of losing his salvation? That doesn't make any sense. So you can't have both. Both of those arguments can stand. So the editors of this video need to go back and delete that part. Pick which one you want to delete. Pick 1 Corinthians 9 or Romans 7. But both of them cannot stand. Those are those are two competing statements that they're making. Paul uh, did not struggle with sin or he struggled with sin so much that he had to fight to make sure he didn't lose his salvation. You can't keep both of them. So let's go back to what their other counter arguments are. All your past sins are forgiven when you're first saved, but your future sins are not pre-forgiven. In other words, you start with a clean slate, but you can muddy that slate again. Uh, we know that we're forgiven our past sins, not our future sins, because in 2 Peter chapter 1, it warns about those who forget that they were cleansed from their past sins. That's why we read in James chapter 5, verse 19 and 20, when the brother who is brought back after he falls away from the Lord, it says you'll save a soul from death and hide a multitude of sins. If people say their future sins are also forgiven, like some people do preach, then 1 John 2, 1, 1 John 1, 9 is meaningless. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. I'll say, Lord, I have to confess nothing. They're already forgiven. Okay. Let's deal with that. By the way, by the way, he, one of the questions he also brought up, I, I forgot to bring up about Paul. Paul does, does never present himself as though he has to struggle with sin, but yes, Paul does. Paul's the one who's given the thorn in the flesh because he says, so I don't exalt myself. Paul is the one who's been boastful. And so instead of boasting about me, I'll boast about uh, my infirmities. Paul is the one who calls himself a chief sinner. And do we think that Paul is the worst sinner of all time? No. I think Paul is speaking hyper hi hyperbole, but I don't think Paul is lying that he doesn't sin. Paul says that I'm a man when they thought that him and Barnabas were some kind of gods. He says, no, I'm a we are men just like you with the same nature as you. So yes, Paul um, does talk about his own particular struggles. Now, in this case, the issue is, do we have future sins? I mean, I mean, are our future sins also forgiven? Well, to say they're not is, I think, just misses the whole boat completely. Let's go to a couple passages, shall we? How about Colossians 2.13? I almost pushed the wrong button. Colossians 2.13. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, 
he made you alive together with him. Having forgiven, by the way, guys, this word is a aorist, middle participle. So it's past tense and the resulting effect is ongoing. Having forgiven us all, that word panta is all of our sins or transgressions. And what did he do? Having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees, decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. You know what we don't have anymore? We don't have a debt, ladies and gentlemen. That's why Jesus on the cross said, Tetelestai, which is, it is finished. They use that very same word in terms of financial transactions. Say, I don't, there's nothing else. Nothing else is owed. Now, to make this point even stronger, how about John 5, 24? Let's use John 5, 24. This is Jesus speaking. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my voice and believes. There's that word again, that pistuan, the one that's believing, the one that's believing him who sent me. The Bible says he has, eke, right now, present, he has right now, life into the ages, eternal life. That's what this is, life into the ages. He has it when? Ladies and gentlemen, according to the text, when does when the person that believes, the believing person, the person truly believes, and God knows who that is, when do they have life into the ages? Right now. Eternal life, Right, he has it right now. But notice what he says. And does not come into judgment. And not into, now, his, here, look what it says. Let's just go through the Greek. Ice into Increasing judgment. So into judgment, uk not erkatai will go or is going. He is not going into judgment. But here's this word, one of my favorite Greek words, because it it, it it's multiple syllable, but it makes me think of bacon. Metaba bacon. Perfect tense says that has passed from past tense, ladies and gentlemen. If you are a sheep, if you are a believer, you have passed. Look what he says, ek to or ek to from death, but into life. You have passed from death into life. They'll tell you, no, you didn't. You still, if you sin, if you sin, you can still die. If you sin, you can still go into judgment. You haven't passed anything, according to them. Jesus says, no, not medical bacon. <laughs> Jesus says, you have passed from death, you have passed judgment, passed death, and you are going into life. You are going into life. You have it right now. So if I keep sinning, according to them, if I sin some more, and no one has ever given us the magic number, how much sin or what severity of sin will make it so that you will now pass into, now pass in, now pass in, now pass in. Someone says, if you are believing, present, presently actively believing. You're absolutely right, presently actively believing. If you are presently actively believing, he says you have it right now, and because of that, you will never go to judgment, which necessarily has to imply that you will keep believing. Why will you keep believing? Why do we have an expectation of a true believer to keep believing? Why have you, sir, you, ma'am, you people, why, why have you all, why have you kept believing thus far? Because you're so smart, no, because you're wonderful, because you've got a great pastor. No, because you listen to the Smart Christians channel and you're a smart Christian yourself. No, the reason why is because you have the Holy Spirit in you. That's why. That's why you keep believing. Jesus. That's why Jesus can say that. That's why he can make this statement. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have, look what he says, obtained Guys, this word is not a present. This is a perfect active indicative. That means it has been done. You have already obtained what? This peace we have, you have already obtained through whom we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand and we exalt in hope the glory of God. It's done. Now you can fight all, I don't, listen, you can do what you want to. You can fight it. You can, you can drive with the brakes on. You can drive with the... Now, you'll still get going where you're going. You're going to ruin your car. You'll get there. 
You can spend money on things that's already been paid for. You can live your life not as joyfully as you want, but the fact of the matter is you're not helping yourself and you don't, Paul says, you have need of your confidence. I'm not sure if I finished playing that clip. Let me see if I finished. I think, yeah, I did. I finished playing that clip. Now, what I want to do, I was going to go over a couple passages, but I want, I'll go ahead and answer some questions. If anyone has some questions, we'll take a little bit of time and answer some questions. Um, this is a good question. If I can push the button. Corey, how do you imagine, by the way, thank you for the super chat. How do you imagine these guys would reconcile their too far gone arguments with Samson or King Manasseh? And they are Old Testament examples. There's no way they can reconcile. They can't. That's just it. You have to try to figure out what those passages in Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10 mean. You have to. And so they have to say, well, that's a person that they're just so far gone. But then you come back and say they're so far gone. But if you're so far gone, just try to believe some more. Just, try, just come back. But you can't. Their, their arguments are inconsistent. Our arguments are very consistent. But what about all these warning passages? Yes, you, you need to warn people who either aren't saved or people who think they are and are not. You need to warn them. Because my question is, if those warning passages aren't warning false converts who think they're true converts, fine. Where are the passages in the Bible? You mean tell me there's no passages in the Bible where you're warning someone who's a false convert who might think that they are? Because that's what Jesus was doing. That's literally what Jesus was doing. People who, and Paul, if you think you stand, he's warning you. But then why does he say, uh, and one turns him back? Because you're turning a person back to the tenets of the faith. For example, if I believe that Jesus Christ, in James 5, 19, Jesus Christ is the only way. I believe that. You believe that. That's the tenet of our faith, that we need him. He died in our place because of our sin. If you believe that, if you, if you, first of all, if you mentally believe that, you have to at least mentally believe that, believe those sets of facts. If you believe those sets of facts, then what you can do then is you can place your faith in that. If you don't believe that, you can't place your faith in that. So the person in James 5, 19 has walked away from that belief, those tenets of the faith. Maybe there's other ways other than Jesus. Maybe if I just live a good life. Okay, fine. Believe that. Now, if, if, so let's say Tamara, let's, let's just use a person. Let's say Brian, uh, Chess, he walks away from believing that. And you go and, and say, no, Brian, listen, here's the scripture. Here's the gospel. Here's what it says. If you bring him back, what did you just do? You just did that. You turn him, you turn him back to that, 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 that tenet of faith and you save his soul from death. Amen. Uh, more questions. So when a person is, is considered regenerate, uh, a regenerate heart, is it when, uh, okay. First believe. Oh, is it when he first believes or continue? I'm confused. Okay. The age-old question, and we won't we won't settle it right now, but the age-old question is: Does regeneration precede faith? We don't even have to. We don't even have to. We don't have to even address it. We can go this far, and that, that'll be satisfactory. We don't have to worry about if faith. I mean, if regeneration precedes faith, what we do agree, we should agree, is that regeneration keeps faith. So, if your heart, if your heart is not born from above. You cannot keep believing. You just you just won't. You can believe temporarily. Remember Luke eight. You can believe temporarily. Yeah, I'm 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 on to something else. Okay, fine. The cares of the world came, or some new doctrine came, or what have you. You moved on because the seed didn't fall on good ground. But if your heart, which is the good ground, that's God's work. If you're then what 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 does what does Jesus say? If that happens, then you will keep believing and you will bear fruit. And bear a harvest. Amen. Should we look? Sure, we should look at them and brother. Okay. Here's a question, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and I'm, I'm only asking this question because I want to do this. He says, should we look at those, those men as brothers in Christ? Yes. Why? Why should we look at someone, even if they're getting it wrong? First of all, they're brothers in Christ because you don't have to get everything right. I don't get everything right. 
Um, now, if I'm wrong, I want you to show me why. Don't tell me I'm wrong. But I want you to show me why. But there are a lot of things that you can get wrong. It's not what it's not. We're not saved by what we know. We're saved by who we know. And a lot of us who are saved, we don't we think, believe and do some stupid things. Right. You can be saved and stupid. Tweet that you can be saved and stupid. I know everyone was waiting for that. So I had to play it. Yeah. So. So, yeah, they're brothers. We a lot of our brothers and sisters in Christ are just dumb. You know why? Because we're dumb, too. We all do dumb stuff, think dumb stuff. Just who we are. That's why he says grow in the grace and the knowledge. Because we all aren't just that. We're not, we're not as smart and as bright and as clever and as holy and as godly as we think. Please explain 1 John 2, 19. No problem. Let's go to 1 John. Uh, let me move my deal back. Hold on. You all have no idea how, how much I have this thing set up. Uh, oh, there we are. We're on that one. 1 John. Let's put it right here. 1 John 2, 19. And I've heard someone try to explain this passage, uh, explain it away. He says, for they went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out so that it would be shown that they are not all of us. Someone said, well, see, that's only the Antichrist. Well, first of all, it's plural. Children, it is the last hour. And just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now, many Antichrists Antichristoi, which is multiple, plural, have appeared. Uh, from this, we know that it is the last hour. Got them then, got them now. Well, are they some sort of special group? I mean, did they go to did they go to Antichrist class and get a certificate? Do they have a plaque on the wall? Do they have a graduation? No, these are people that go against Christ. Go against it now. In what do, what way, shape, form, or fashion? in various ways, but they've been there and they are now. And so I would say, I think that there's that the case can be made and should be made that anyone that goes against the Bible, that goes against the gospel, that moves away from this belief, that person by definition is anti-Christ. They went out from us, meaning they were part of us. They were with us. They were, they were from us. They were with us. They went out from us. Now, you would say, well, see, Corey, that, that was Christian. They, they were believers, but they couldn't have been believers because he says they were not of us. They were not. Uh oh, why is my thing not showing up? There it is. They were not of us. And so he said, for if they had been of us, what would they have done? They would have remained with us, but they went out. So it's possible person. You know what? I'm saved day and not tomorrow. So. That's what that means. Someone might say, wait, it has to be these antichrists. Well, who's antichrist? What's the antichrist? Is, are there? So that's what, it, that's what it is. Explain that anyone that's left us, they weren't never part of us. Um, is it true that God has to grant repentance? It absolutely is true. And without granting repentance, you can, no, you cannot. Because what's he do, what God is doing is he is fixing the heart. Your heart, according to John 3, must be born from above. And he says that the wind blows where it wishes. It goes where you don't know where it's going to or where it's coming from. So it is of every one of you that's born of the spirit or born from above. And then John 1 12 says that all of us who have been born, we weren't born of our own will. You weren't born again because of your own will. You weren't born again because of flesh or blood, but you were born of the will of God. God does that. God does that. Joan brings up a good question. What about Demas and Alexander the Coppersmith? The reason now, uh, I, I, I won't I won't go too too far in depth in some of these questions. We can do it later. But uh, Alexander, the Bible said Paul says that he he resisted our um, our message. Here's the problem about Alexander. One, we don't know to what degree, but apparently he was accepted as a brother, which means a person can look like a brother, and then we find out no, he's not. Because what what did Al again? Remember I said this point earlier, every time we see someone leaving, what are they leaving from? They're leaving from the faith, or in this case, the message, which is the same thing, the understanding. What did Alexander resist and moved away from? The message. As far as Demas is concerned, I make a case, and by the way, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of different scholars do, some do, some don't, that now we don't know if Demas was ever saved and lost it. We can't say that he was saved and he lost it. We can't say that he lost his salvation. 
nor can we say that he ever was saved. We, we don't know enough. But I want to present to you that maybe Demas is saved, was saved, and, and stayed saved. Why? Because in this conversation, Paul is, is getting, getting ready to die, and Paul says that there are three people that left him. Now, remember, we know Paul's history. Paul doesn't like to be left. Paul doesn't like to be left, does he? Think about John Mark, who, by the way, he says, bring him to me. He, le he, he, he left me alone. He deserted me the last time, and I didn't want to go on a missionary trip with him, which is the reason for him and Barnabas to have that little split. But he says, bring John Mark to me. So he doesn't seem like being left because, you know, Paul goes hard. Paul is serious about this. Demas leaves. There are three names that Paul mentions that have left him. Two of them, we don't, we don't associate with him deserting Paul and walking away. There's Demas. There's Cretan. Do y'all remember the other person's name who we know for a fact is not with him, but is definitely saved? Titus. Titus is where, and, and, and Domitia. Is that, is, is he in time? Wherever, wherever Titus went. Titus also left. So in that same sense, he mentions those, those three. And so it seems either the, that two of them are believers, but Demas isn't. And so it could be, it could be that Demas just left, but did not lose his salvation. Now, him leaving, we'd have to figure out, well, was he saved in the first place? Or did he ever, or was he saved and then lost? So we, we don't have, we don't have a reason to believe either. We don't have enough information. Uh, let's see. Any more questions? I think I have to have, and then we can go ahead and move on. Let me take, let me take one or two more questions and then we will move on. By the way, if you go to the, to the channel, if you, if you go on the YouTube channel and you go under the playlist, there's this soteriology and a lot of these other passages, Galatians 5, uh, 2 Peter and so forth. I've covered those before. Um, so go to, go to there if you want to see other passages. Where you say, but would they have the Holy Spirit in them, the one who has the the nine good ground? No, no. The person who the seed was sown on good ground. First of all, God gives you the Holy Spirit. He's not giving the Holy Spirit uh, only to turn around and lose. Remember what it says that he that he gives the Holy Spirit as one as a pledge, as an arbon, as a down payment until when? So this arbon, this earnest money, this guarantee, this money is a down payment, is a deposit until we get to our final destination. And someone might say, well, yeah, but you can you can put a deposit down and forfeit that. Yeah, we could, and maybe we have done so. But we're talking about God giving us the Holy Spirit as a deposit. Let's think about what we're actually saying if we're going to say that God, I'm not, I know you're not saying that, meow, but if we're saying that God gave us the Holy Spirit as a deposit till we get to where we're going, and then it gets forfeited. That's why, that's why Paul comes back and says, that's why I'm confident that he who began a good work in you, he is faithful to complete it. He's going to see it through. You're not faithful, but he is. And so, ladies and gentlemen, the whole point about, the whole point about salvation, I think we miss it. The reason why, and this will be it, the reason why you are saved or the reason why you're not saved, the reason why you go to heaven or the reason why you go to hell, the reason why you'll have eternal life or you have eternal damnation. There's only one reason. It's what is owed if you have an outstanding account, an outstanding account balance, meaning there's a debt that hadn't been paid or a debt that's been paid, but you haven't placed faith in it. Meaning under the old covenant, I want y'all to understand this. I want you to understand how the atonement worked. You had to afflict your soul, humble yourself, no working and fasting. And then what happens? The high priest, one, confesses all the sin of the people. All the sin of the people are confessed on the head of the scapegoat. Then on the sacrificial offering, he sacrificed. And so a couple of things have happened. There's a covering and a canceling. There's a covering of your sin. So he doesn't see the sin anymore. And then the debt is canceled. So the Lord says, you stolen from me. You stolen 
my favorite coffee cup. But you can't keep bringing that same stolen coffee cup in my face and think I'm going to be okay with that. I want to be reconciled. I want to have a relationship with you. But you can't have a relationship with me if you keep bringing this coffee cup to my face. We can't do that. So I would say this. Well, how can we then be reconciled? You want to be reconciled. And I say, here are my terms. Now, remember, this is God setting the terms. So he's not going to set the terms and then come back and, and renege on his own terms. So if I say, let's just say uh, Sheila. Matter of fact, Sheila, Monkey Moves, and Jeff conspired to steal my coffee cup. I love them every time I see them. One of them, every time I see them, one of the three has my coffee cup. They have gone so far, they've even gotten t-shirts with my coffee cup on their t-shirt. Uh, just like, just laugh, put it in my face. I'm angry with them. I'm so, I'm listen, I'm so angry. How angry am I? I got my man, Brian L. Chess. I said, Brian, you got your, you got your gun. <laughs> you got your gun, Brian. I want you to go do something to him. I don't want you to kill him. Not yet. Just, you know, make him hurt a little bit. They say, well, wait a second, Corey. We, we, we're, we're sorry. We apologize. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You can't just come and say, I apologize. We have, there's gotta be something that happens. There gotta be some atonement here. So who determines what the atonement be? Cause Lord, I don't, you know, we don't want to see monkey moves get shot up. We don't want to see Sheila and Jeff get shot up. Now, Brian ain't necessarily the best aim, but he got a bunch of bullets. So we want to fix this. So what do we do? I said, I'll tell you what I want you to do. I want you to give me back my cup. And I want you to give me two more cups and a thousand dollars. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Corey. That's just too much. I'm giving you back that. No, you can't come and tell me what I was going to make it, make it right. You can't tell me how to fix this. I'm telling you what it will take for me to forgive you. <laughs> Rodney said, just brace him. Okay, we're just going to brace him in the head. Just nick him. Yeah. If how much, however much hair Jeff has, just give him a part. You can't tell me how, how it, this has to be atoned. And we'll just shoot, shoot Sheila in the foot and the pinky toe. <laughs> You can't tell me how to how to be rectified. You can't tell me what's going to make me whole. I tell you. Now, you say, fine. My cup back and three more cups and $1,000, done. So if you, because you want to have this relationship and I want to have this relationship, but I want to make sure you don't do it again, you bring me back my coffee cup. You get rid of those ridiculous t-shirts flaunting in, in front of me. You bring me back three other cups and then you bring me $1,000 each. After you've done that, what happens? We're reconciled. We're buddy. We're hugging it out. Matter of fact, I turn around and give you them cups back. Let's all let's all drink. Cheers. You know what I can't do? I can't next week, next month, next year. Say monkey moves. Let me talk to you. Remember that, remember that time you stole my cup? Yeah, you and Sheila was just you, Sheila and Jeff, y'all just yucking it up and drinking it. I can't bring that up again, can I? I cannot bring it up again. Okay, yeah, we, we, need, another, we need another cup so we can pay off. We'll give the $1,000 to, to Chess. We'll give him the $1,000. I can't bring that up again. Why? Because the debt is paid. I'm going somewhere, ladies and gentlemen. So if the debt is paid, there is all the sins that you've committed or will commit because it's not like the person that's confessing the sins on the scapegoat is... Well, what about next year? Well, because under the old covenant, you would have to worry about next year's sins, but not with Jesus. So all your sins are confessed. The blood is shed to pay the debt. All that I've ever required is taken care of and satisfied. And you trust me enough to believe that I have forgiven you and you come to me and we have fellowship. That is literally what's happened. We have a high priest, according to Hebrews. We have a scapegoat, a lamb that takes away the sins of the world, according to John and Hebrews. 
and we have a better sacrifice according to Hebrews 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. We have a better sacrifice that Jesus himself said before his last breath said, it is paid for. Colossians says the debt is paid and it's been nailed to the cross. So when someone comes back and tells you that, tell them go back and read their Bible. If they don't come back with the same conclusion, go back and read it again. What he said, he meant. And if it's finished, it's finished. There is no longer a debt that can be paid. As Paul put it, it is God who justifies. If he justifies, then who, even with a documentary, can bring a charge against us? Amen.